I want you to get that in your heart. I want you to get that in your mind. I break every curse that's been over your life that has defined failure as normal. God never wants your circumstances. He doesn't want you to deny them. A storm is a storm. You don't call it a sunshine day. A storm is reality. But he never wants your circumstance to trump his word. Joshua fought his first battle at Jericho. He devastated the place. The walls came tumbling down. They entered the city. They took over the city. They set the city on fire. He was winning. The next battle he had to fight was at Ai. Ai was going to be easy. It was a piece of cake. It was small compared to Jericho. Jericho was sophisticated. Jericho had walls around it thick enough that the chariots could ride on the top of the walls. Ai didn't even have any walls around it. It was easy. It was a piece of cake. We'll take this out in our sleep. I know how to do this. And they lost. Ai whipped their socks off. Beat them half to death. And when we read in the previous chapter, Joshua is having what my grandmother would call a hissy fit. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly what a hissy fit is. I couldn't find it in Webster's Dictionary, but it always sounded real bad. Anybody ever hear of a hissy fit? Joshua is having a hissy fit. He's tore his clothes off. He's rent his garments. He's thrown ashes on his face. All the leaders are falling out like babies crying with wet diapers. They're all having fits and seizures because they reject the spirit of failure. That's important. I'm glad you noticed that. That was a good point. They reject the spirit of failure. It is important that you reject the spirit of failure. When you accept the spirit of failure as if it were normal, you will lose your fight back. There ought to be something in you that has a hissy fit when you fail. Because you're not expecting to fail, you didn't get up to fail, you didn't train to fail, you don't expect to fail, you don't take failure as normal, you can't stand to fail. Holler at me if you're hearing what I'm saying. Joshua's laying down on the floor, kicking like a baby, screaming, throwing dust up in the air. He's having a fit. Look at his aversion to failure. You see, you get what you expect. Oh my God, I'm preaching better than you shouting. You get what you expect. If you expect failure, you say, well, I lost. I guess it wasn't meant to be. If the Lord would have wanted me to have it, I would have had it. It must not be God's will for my life. I guess I'm supposed to be down. I guess I'm not supposed to run track again. I guess I don't deserve to be on the football team. I guess we're supposed to lose. I guess I'm supposed to be broke. And you build a culture around losing. And once you build a culture around losing, even when people try to get you to win, you will acquiesce back to the level of your thinking because you built a culture around failure. You built a culture around being unloved. You built a culture around being divorced. You built a culture around being rejected. You're not happy till somebody rejects you. You're not happy till you're in a fight. Oh my God. When Joshua lost, he almost lost his mind. He said, this is not normal. I am not supposed to lose. 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 I am not supposed to. That's right, I want you to get that in your spirit. I want you to get that in your heart. I want you to get that in your mind. I break every curse that's been over your life that has defined failure as normal. 
I am not supposed to say it again. Say it again. See, when you have that mentality, when you have that mentality, it doesn't mean that you won't lose. It does mean that you won't lay in your losses. Many of you know the story. God told Joshua, the reason you lost is that there's sin in the camp. Yeah, the, the reason you lost is that there's sin in the camp. In other words, the reason you lost is because disobedience is in the camp, because sin is disobedience. God says the reason you're losing is because sin is in the camp. You disobeyed me. You went in your own way. You took me for granted. You thought you could do it your way and come out on top. You tried to slick the master. The reason you lost is that you didn't do it the way I told you to do it. You're stubborn and you're self-willed and you got your own mind about things. And because sin is in the camp, you lost the battle. You and all of your men lost the battle. Because I will be with you. But I'm not going to be with you if you're going to do it your way. I have cut people a loose because they did it their way. Don't keep me on the phone all night asking me for advice that you are not going to follow. Don't do that. Once I learn that you're going to do it your way, I see your name come up on the phone, I, I just keep looking at it. I keep looking at it till it go away. I don't push decline because I don't want you to know, but I just let it ring and ring and ring and ring because my time is too precious to be wasted on somebody who is going to do it their way. You can't run your marriage your way and expect to win. You can't do business your way and expect to win. The worst part about it is Joshua had not sinned. Joshua had not sinned, nor did he even know that there was sin in the camp. He learned there was sin in the camp by losing. It, it, it's not like Joshua had done something to lose, but he was connected. He was connected to somebody who had done something that caused all of Israel to lose because of who they were connected to. Be careful who you connect with. So Joshua said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take tribe by tribe, tent by tent, family by family, until we find this sinner. And he starts going through the camp because the one thing Joshua knew is that he was not supposed to lose. And he said, as soon as I find this, I'm gonna straighten this out. So here come this brother in the camp way back in the fifth section on the ninth row in the bleed section named Aiken. Yes, sir. And Aiken said, uh, what had happened was <laughs> while, while we were destroying Jericho, uh, I went in this tent and this fine Babylonian garment was in the tent. It, it was so sharp and it was, and it was about 200 shekels of gold and I wrapped the gold up in the garment and, and I kept it. And I kept it and I didn't tell anybody. Now let me tell you why that was a problem. God had told them to utterly destroy everything in Jericho to save 
nothing in Jericho to burn it completely. Everything. Don't take nothing for yourself. Don't hold nothing back. Don't save an ox, a lamb, a goat, a dove. Burn it all. Let me tell you why. Canaan or Jericho was the first city. It is the principle of the first fruits. It belonged to God. God said, if you give me the first fruits, I'll give you everything that comes after it. This ties in to the New Testament. Seek ye first the kingdom and then all these things shall be added unto you. If he would have given God Jericho first, the reason God wanted it burnt, it was to be a burn offering, a sin offering, a trespass offering. He said, totally destroy it. It will pay for everything you did wrong and you'll win the rest of the journey. But oh no, not Brother Aiken. Brother Aiken was, was determined he was gonna do it his way and they lost the battle. So they took Achan out and they stoned him and his wife and his kids and his animals and his oxen and his dog and his goldfish and all of his puppies. They stoned everything that was standing in between them and victory. They stoned everything that was standing in between them and victory. They stoned everything that was standing in between them and victory. They stoned everything that was standing in between. They stoned every pride, lust, jealousy, envy, unforgiveness. I'm a stone every thing that's standing in between me and victory because I have learned from my losses that holding on to you is not worth losing it. When we come into the text now in the eighth chapter, Joshua now has a second chance. God says, I am going to give you AI. Now he is fighting where he lost. This is an important message. This is a prophetic word. He is fighting where he lost. He is going back to fight something that he failed in in the past. There is no fear like going back to fight in a place where you have failed in the past. When you're in a fresh fight, you don't know till you're in it whether you're going to win or lose. But when you're fighting something that has a history of beating you, this is a prophetic word for somebody. You're going to have to go back and fight in the same area where you lost. And God told him, to stretch forth your javelin and not to stop until you have utterly destroyed AI. Yeah. You don't have a rod like Moses. You got a javelin. But I will be in your javelin like I was in Moses' rod. And you don't have to be nobody else. But if you stretch forth what God gave you, it will work just as good as what God gave somebody else. Look at somebody and say, stretch forth your javelin. And, and God said, when you stretch it forth, don't stop. I wish I had time to do this just. See, before Joshua used to get in fights, Moses was up there on the mountaintop lifting up his hands. It was never Joshua's fighting that got him the victory. It was Moses' intercession. 
but he didn't understand the power of intercession and now he has to be what he didn't see. Stretching forth his javelin was like Moses raising his hands. It was the signal that procured the victory. But you couldn't stretch it forth and get tired and say, my arm hurts. I'm tired of this. I want to do something else. I'm going to give you something. This is important. I want you to get this. I want you to get this and I want you to keep this the rest of your life. Being relentless will get you there. Being relentless will get you there. Anything, anytime you see anybody who's amazing at anything, they've been relentless. Whether it's building buildings or playing concert piano or whether it's, it's artwork or whatever they master, they got there because they were relentless. They got there because they rehearsed while you was watching TV. They got there because they worked on it while you was playing basketball. They got successful because they did it every day, every day, every day, over and over. If you do anything long enough, you will get good at it. Being relentless will get you there. But being consistent will keep you there. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Being relentless will get you there, but being consistent will keep you there. A lot of people are relentless enough to get there, but they're not consistent enough to stay there. I got one more point for you. Being grateful will increase what's there. So, so we, we want to go back. We're going to do a review right quick. I want you to get this in your spirit. Being relentless will do what? Being consistent will do what? But being grateful will increase what's there. When you are grateful for what you have been relentless and consistent about, you will get more of what you're grateful for. When you are grateful and don't take it for granted, you will get more of what you were asking for. Jesus has been teaching all day. He's been teaching the crowds, preaching the big sermon, and then he takes his disciples aside and he gives them a private word. He says in verse 33 of Mark 4, with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. Jesus said, get in the boat. They got in the boat after the sermon. They listened to the word. He said, get in the boat. They got in the boat. And they are doing exactly what they were told to do. They are perfectly situated. Not only are they in the will of God, Jesus is in there with them. Because it says Jesus got in the boat too. So it, life can't be better than having church, hearing the word, and Jesus joins you in the boat. So Jesus is in the boat. They're going their way over to the other side. But while in the will of God and on the boat with the Lord, there's a problem. The problem is described in verse 37. There arose a fierce gale of wind and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already filling up. The Greek word here for fierce gale of wind is lilac. A lilac was a tumultuous storm coming out of nowhere on the Sea of Galilee. And while they were obeying God, in God's will, doing exactly what God said, after church was over, Jesus had finished teaching, they run into a storm. And it's a whopper. It's so bad that the boat is filling up. 
And so they are caught in a storm while being in the will of God. So the first thing that you need to know is that in the will of God, it does rain. You can be smack dab in the will of God and be in the middle of a lilac. You can be smack dab doing exactly what God tells you to do and the boat of your security begins to sink. You can be smack dab in the will of God. Now, obviously, you can be out of the will of God and be in a storm, and you can be in the will of God. So this ought to clarify, as we've tried to do all along, that storms in and of themselves do not tell you whether you're in or out of God's will. What tells you whether you're in or out of God's will is did you do what he tells you to do? But whether you did it or you didn't do it, you can still be in a lilac. That is, a tumultuous situation. The other thing you need to know about this lilac is it's merciless. That is, it comes down on you and it seeks to consume you. But let me tell you something else about a storm. A storm is always designed to increase your faith and give you a deeper experience with your God. Storms aren't pleasant, they aren't comfortable, and sometimes they can be life-threatening, but they always come with a purpose. So here they are in a crisis. They're in this crisis, and the crisis was threefold. There are actually three storms occurring here. Let me walk you through the three storms. First of all, there is a circumstantial storm, the lilac. I'll say one more thing about this circumstantial storm, and that is it was a storm over which they could exercise no control. You can't control the wind. You can't control the sea. You can't control the rain. You can't control the the spinning of the turmoil. You can't control waves billowing up and going. You can't control that. That is out of your control. So you can be in the will of God and in a storm and absolutely be able to do nothing about it because you can't control a lilac. It's circumstances that produces a helpless and sometimes the feeling of a hopeless scenario. So that's storm number one. That leads to storm number two. Storm number two is that they were terrified. We know that they were terrified because Jesus is going to say to them, why are you afraid in verse 40? So they weren't scared, they were stirred. Now we're talking terrified. So now we not only have a storm of circumstance, we have a storm of emotion. Because their emotions have riveted up and they are scared about the doctor's report, scared about the financial struggle, scared about the the relationship direction, scared, whatever it is that you can't control that's causing your emotions to be uprooted is your lilac. Because it's something so big, so deep, and so devastating, you can't control it. So the first storm are circumstances out of their control. The second storm is their emotional instability because of the uncontrollable circumstance. But there's a third storm here. We'll call it a theological storm. Because not only was their circumstance out of control, and now their emotions responding to their circumstance, they now have a spiritual storm, a theological storm, because the scripture goes on to say that they woke up Jesus and said in verse 38, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? See, that's a spiritual storm. Because their circumstances were out of control and their emotions have gone crazy, Now they question whether what they have been believing is true. If we were to tell the truth and shame the devil, there have been those times when we have to raise the question like Martha and Mary, where were you when I needed you? Because if you would have been here, it wouldn't be this painful, it wouldn't take this long, and it wouldn't hurt this bad. Teacher, do you really care Because you're overwhelmed. That naturally leads to a spiritual question. Where were you, God? Uh, Let's go a little deeper. Because verse 38 says, Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep 
on the cushion. No, you didn't. Oh, no, you didn't, Jesus. I'm in a storm and you're snoring. I'm in a storm and you're sleeping. This is serious sleep. So that meant he sleep on purpose. So not only is Jesus asleep, not only is he asleep on purpose, he's asleep in a storm. Okay, now I got another problem. Because he's sleeping on me and he's in the same storm I'm in. Because he's on the same boat I'm on. He sleep on a storm and the only way he gets up is I got to wake him up. It says they woke him up. That's when you're crying out because it's so bad, so deep for so long. And they, 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 they shook him and they said, don't you care? Because if you cared, we wouldn't even, even if you were tired, we wouldn't have to wake you up. You got, you getting wet like we getting wet. The boat's flipping and flopping you like it's flipping and flopping us. And you are asleep. Jesus had just taught the disciples that just come from church, so to speak. And now they're under pressure. And it's tough. Does Jesus care about my pain, my finances, my loneliness, my hurt, my depression? Because I'm in his will and I feel all this. And so, they wake Jesus up. Verse 39, Jesus gets up and he rebukes the wind and says to the sea, hush your fuss. Hush, be still. Notice who Jesus is talking to. He's going to talk to them, but he's not talking to them right now. He's talking to the circumstance. The circumstance is the wind and the sea. It's a storm. He doesn't speak to them yet. He speaks to the situation. But when does he speak to the situation? After they wake him up. So Jesus is asleep. They wake him up. When they wake him up, he speaks to the circumstance that was causing the crisis. So don't let it be said your crisis continues because you never took the time to wake the Savior up. In other words, you were not so concerned about it that getting his attention to it was unimportant. Because we'll wake up our friends, we'll wake up people with power, we'll wake up people who we think can change it, and a lot of times we don't try to wake up the Savior. Now I'm explaining you, because I know what you're saying. You say, well, he shouldn't be asleep. I got you. Stick with me here. Because, see, I know what you're thinking. And the reason I know what you're thinking is because I've had to think it too. Because we all face storms. Different shapes, different sizes, equally real. And so Jesus now turns to his disciples. Why are you afraid, verse 40, how is it that you have no faith? Now, I don't know about you, but I have issues with the question. I got issues with that question. Because that question doesn't make sense to me. They wake Jesus up. The boat's filling with water. They're in a lilac. It's a terrible storm. They don't even know whether they're going to live or die. And Jesus is going to ask a question like that. Why are you afraid? And why do you have no faith? Oh, I don't know, Jesus. Maybe it's because we're getting ready to die. I mean, a question like that is like somebody asking a swimmer who just gets out the water, why are you wet? Isn't it pretty obvious? I mean, this is, this is not that deep, G. Oh, excuse me, Jesus. It's not that deep. We're in trouble. Why are you afraid? Why the question? Well, that takes us back to verse 35. Because in verse 35, Jesus said, let us go to the other side. But when the circumstances showed up, they overrode what I said. In other words, your problem overrode my promise. 
So you are now living in light of the problem, no longer living in light of the promise. And when you live in light of the problem and no longer in light of the promise, the problem will dominate you and it will totally erase the fact I ever made one. God never wants your circumstances. He doesn't want you to deny them. A storm is a storm. You don't call it a sunshine day. A storm is reality. But he never wants your circumstance to trump his word. Not only does he not want your circumstance to trump his word, he doesn't want your circumstance to trump his presence. Because he's on the boat too. Because storms are designed to deepen your faith and heighten your experience with him. They're not pleasant, but they are unavoidable because you can't control lilacs. You can't control when they come, how they come, and how long they stay. And so that's our scenario. That's our situation. Their circumstance was determining their theology, and their circumstance caused them to forget what God said. Oh, but when he spoke, he told the wind, chill. He just chill. He told the sea, shh. And when Jesus spoke to the circumstance, the circumstance has changed. So the issue in a lilac is not your ability to change the circumstance. The issue in a lilac is your communication with Jesus so he can speak to it. And so Jesus speaks to the problem and when he speaks to the problem, there is a circumstantial change. And then it leads to a conclusion. And oh, what a conclusion it is. Verse 41 says, they became very much afraid. I, I don't think you just read that with me. Verse 41 says, they became very much afraid. Okay, maybe they'll get it on this side. <laughs> Verse 41 says, they became very much afraid. Okay, when they were in the lilac, they were afraid. When they saw who they were dealing with, they became very much afraid. In other words, we afraid of the wrong thing. <laughs> See, we let our circumstances scare us. He says, when you know who you're dealing with, <laughs> you'll be less afraid of that and more scared of me. So it's more important to, by faith, get Jesus dealing with the circumstance then you living in fear, don't be scared of the wrong thing. And they ask a question, because they're scared now. Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. Who then is this? Obviously, we don't know who he is. Let me tell you something. When Jesus' humanity, his sleep, his deity stays awake. Who then is this? They were on a journey of discovery. Trials, as inconvenient and as painful as they are, are a journey of discovery of who you're dealing with. Okay? God has placed you, it's not convenient, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but you are in a situation where God wants you to know who you're dealing with. Because he's human, and we, we call this in theology the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union means two natures in one person unmixed forever. Two natures in one person unmixed forever. So he's both human and divine. See, so God fertilized the egg of a woman. He fertilized the egg of Mary without a male sperm so that the Holy Spirit would provide the divine and Mary would provide the human so that the human and the divine would be mixed in one person without sin forever. That's a hypostatic union. So, so one minute he's thirsty, the Bible says. He said, I thirst. But the next minute he's walking on water and... and, and and stopping storms and stuff. 
One minute he says, I hunger. The next minute he's taking sardines and crackers and making a folk Moby Dick sandwich to feed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, over 20,000 people. One moment he died on a cross. Another moment he raising folk from the dead. Come on, who are you? What manner of man is this? Hebrews 4 says, and we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our pain. How can you sympathize with my pain? Because I'm human. So I can feel what you feel the way you felt it. But I'm divine. See, when I go to you or you go to me, that's human to human. I may be able to sympathize but not be able to fix it. But when you deal with the God man, you're dealing with someone who can feel it and fix it. God says, because I'm a man, I know how you feel. But because I'm God, I can do something with it. What manner of man is this? That even the circumstances, nature obeys him. That nature has to succumb to him. So if you have a lilac, and if you don't have one, keep living. You will. God wants to take you to a place of understanding in him that you've never been before. 